So this is a Petzl rad line and this video is all about how to get the most out of using this rope. So this is my masterclass and this is part one. So let's dive in. So this is a Petzl rad line and it's a hyperstatic six mil cord, which has been specifically designed for ski mountaineering. So this is part one of a multi-part series. I haven't quite decided how many parts it's gonna be yet. So in this video, we're gonna talk about all the gear and techniques that you might be using a Petzl rad line for. And then in future videos, we're gonna be talking through in a little bit more depth about those topics. So tune in for that, make sure you've hit that subscribe button and let's start with what you might use a rad line for. So in this bag, I have a 30 meter Petzl rad line and I carry this most days when I go skiing in the mountains, unless I know that I need a longer rope and then I might bring a 60 meter rope or if I'm doing something that involves some climbing and then I'd bring a dynamic rope. 30 meters is kind of useful and if you have a couple of 30 meter lengths of rope in the group, then that's gonna give you multiple options for rappelling, crevasse rescue, roping up on a glacier. However, what I would say is the one thing that I think people should do a lot more of when they're out backcountry skiing is using a rope to cut a slope. Yeah. So what we've got is a ski that's placed vertically down as hard as I can go and then I've got a sling around it doubled up so a 120 centimeter sling doubled up and then I'm stood on top of that sling and leaning against the snow the, the ski and that way I'm compressing the snow that the ski's in. I'm holding the ski back and also it has my ski in front this other ski in front of it. As so well. you can even yeah uh, so wow. it's a really quick anchor for doing a slope cut like this. You can basically just tie the rope around your waist, make a really quick, easy snow anchor. Then you can do a slope cut and you're tied on to an anchor at the top of the slope. And if something happens, you're not gonna get dragged down with it into that terrain trap, into that deposition zone. So you can really quickly and easily set that up. And this is definitely a lot lighter and more versatile than let's say an ABS bag. The other thing that we would be using a rope for is doing a rappel, whether that's a planned rappel or an emergency rappel where you maybe get cliffed out and you need to rappel off some bushes to get down or you're in a cool wire and you have to get over a bulge of ice. Crevasse rescue is the other thing that you'd need a rope for in ski mountaineering or skiing, especially around here in the Alps. We do have quite a lot of glaciers. We often are skiing together unroped and somebody could fall in a crevasse and you need to be able to get a rope to them as quick as possible because the longer that they spend in that crevasse, the more chance they have of getting kind of frozen into that crevasse and then stuck. So skiing the big runs off the Agri de Milly, like Valley Blanche and the Onvers and things like that, which definitely always be having a rope in the group, at least one, ideally two or three, because if somebody falls in who has the rope and there isn't another rope in the group, yeah, you get the idea. You really need to be able to make sure you're gonna have at least one rope on the surface. Crevasse rescue can come in all different shapes and sizes. It can be as simple as just getting somebody who's kind of half hanging in a crevasse out, or it could be, you know, getting down into a crevasse, giving somebody first aid and then actually Pull, pulling them and hauling them out of that crevasse. So you need a lot of skills to be able to accomplish that. Crossing a Bergschrund is another example of when you might need a rope. Crossing a Bergschrund is basically the crack that appears around the bottom of the mountain where the glaciers coming away from that mountain slope. And often when we're accessing ski lines or even just climbing up over a col, we might have to cross that Bergschrund and putting a rope on for that could be necessary. The rad line works well, but it's not ideal because it's hyperstatic, which means that it doesn't have any stretch. So if you were to fall in the Bergschrund, then it's gonna be quite a shock load onto you. So you have to be aware of that. But what I would say is in that situation, the snow on the lip of the crevasse or the lip of the Bergschrund is probably gonna absorb quite a lot of that impact, which is a good thing, but it is definitely worth considering that these are fully static. You don't wanna be taking a big 
dynamic fall. So you need to keep that rope as tight as possible when you're getting over those bergschrunds. So the other thing that we use a rope for in ski mountaineering is roping up when we're traveling over a glacier and having a Petzl rad line it does work for that, but again, that hypostatic nature means that if somebody falls in, you're gonna be getting a big shock load onto you. So yeah, it's nice and light compared with a single rated rope or even a half or twin rated rope. This is much a smaller and neater package, but it can have that issue of somebody falling in, you're gonna get quite a big shock load on you. So let's talk about how you're gonna store your rope and how you're gonna carry it around in the mountains. You have a couple of options really. One is to use a rope bag like this, and this is what I default to most of the time, and I'll explain why in a minute. And the other option is to coil that rope up and kind of have it on you and wearing it on the outside. The pros to that method are the weight of the rope is evenly distributed on your body. So when you're making turns, the rope is kind of central and your center of gravity is central over your ski boots, which is a good thing. And also you can take that rope off easily without having to take the bag off. And then you simply have to uncoil it to deploy it, which if it's only 30 meters, doesn't take that long. If it's 60 meters, it can take a little bit longer. The downside to that though, is you do have this extra thing on you and it kind of can get in the way. It can get caught on bushes when you're skiing out at the end of a, like a descent down through the forest. One of the benefits with having a rope bag like this is you can use it like a throw bag. So I can throw this into a crevasse. So let's say somebody's fallen in a crevasse and I need to get a rope to them as quick as possible. I can clip this end onto my harness and I can just throw this bag and it's gonna go straight into where I want it to be. And then there's a big loop in the bottom of here and inside this bag is a figure of eight, a re-threaded figure of eight. So that means that this is a loop and they can just clip to that loop and I can pull the excess slack up. If somebody's kind of just half in a crevasse, if they're hanging a little bit and they kind of, they're in a precarious situation, taking that time to uncoil a rope and throw it to somebody can make a big difference. So this rope bag, I've kind of been working with this company Gear Perspective over in the States, and we've kind of been developing this bag to suit the needs of this specific application. This bag isn't on the market yet, but we're hoping to maybe release it in the future. So let me know your thoughts on this bag in the comments and whether it's something you might buy. If you buy the Petzl Rad system, from them, it comes with its own bag. It's a reasonably good bag. I think this one is slightly better because I can have this loop coming out the bottom. This daisy chain on the side is useful for hanging the rope on the side of your harness when you're rappelling, for example. So you don't have to throw the rope down into the crevasse. Having a loop as well at the top here means that you can clip it to the front of your harness and it makes it a little bit easier when you're stuffing it away. Here's the technique that I use. I basically have a carabiner clipped to my helmet strap and I have this clipped to my belay loop and then I'm just stuffing that rope into the bag and it's quite quick and efficient to do that. But having the right bag and having the right setup for that does make the big difference. So when I have the rope stuffed in this stuff sack, I put that into the bottom of my bag and I make sure that I have this end of the rope coming out of the zipped back panel of my rucksack. That means I can quickly and easily pull rope out if I want to rope up on a glacier, for example, or give a rope to somebody when they want to cut a slope. Uh, it's just really good to have quick, easy access to that rope because it means that you're much more likely to use it. All I've done to tie that on here is tie a barrel knot that goes around this carabiner. So it should be fairly loose and easy to untie if I need to you know, use it for a rappel, for example, and tie two ropes together for that rappel. So you know, don't cinch it up too tight, but it should be enough that the carabiner isn't kind of moving around too much and that rope is kind of staying in the bottom of there. And that's plenty strong enough uh, for this application here. So let's just talk about some of the devices that you need to be able to work with these ropes for those specific techniques. And in later videos, we're gonna talk about crevasse rescue, rappelling, all that kind of stuff. So let's have a quick look at the devices. So there's three devices that might be quite useful when you're working with these ropes for going up the rope 
or also for in crevasse rescue situations. So the first device is the micro traction and this is a classic device to be using in crevasse rescue situations and this works perfectly with the Petzl Radline for the application of pulling somebody's weight statically up the rope. It's not going to withstand big falls or any kind of dynamic load because these teeth is simply going to rip the sheath off this rope and it's going to really damage that rope. But for a static load of hauling, this is going to work well. There's also the nano traction, which is a smaller device to use with this rope. It doesn't have a function for locking the teeth open, so it basically only works as a progress capture device. But the micro traction will also work as a pulley because you can lock the teeth open. The third device that we might use is the Petzl Tib Lock, and this is going to work well, you know, for example, if you have to climb back up a single strand of rope. For me, I'm pretty much always carrying either a micro traction and a tib lock or a nano traction and a tib lock when I'm in the mountains. Deciding between the nano traction and the micro traction can be quite difficult. But what I would say is, unless you're really concerned about the weight, which is when you would use the nano traction, I would go for the micro traction because it's a little bit easier to use. For example, the aperture on here for clipping a carabiner through is a little bit bigger so you can actually pass a carabiner gate through it but you can't do that with the nano traction and as I said you can't lock teeth back as well. So when we're using these ropes we also need a device for being able to rappel down on them. Now you can use a munter hitch and that works pretty well on these thin ropes but it does tend to twist those ropes up quite a lot. Now that might be less of a problem if you're only doing one or possibly two rappels and you don't want to carry the weight of a device, you could just use a munter hitch. But I pretty much always have a Petzl Reverso with me for use with these ropes. There are a couple of other devices out there that work. This is the Edelrid Mago 8 and this works pretty well, but I do find it a little bit awkward for certain things and most of the time I am actually just taking my Reverso and there's a couple of ways that you can gain extra friction from this if you need that. Do you find actually for me with my weight when I'm doing a relatively not a vertical rappel when I'm doing a off vertical rappel that just having it through the device normally is enough friction for me. You need to go out and test this if you're going to be using these ropes and also you need to get some experience on what it feels like to be rappelling on something so thin that you might not actually be able to hold on to that dead rope. Obviously when you're rappelling you always want to use a third hand. Third hand is also known as an auto block but yes there is other ways that you can gain more friction with this rope. I'm going to show you some of these now. So on a single strand of rope like this, you can stitch the rope through this device and that's going to give you a little bit more friction as it goes over the central bar. What you want to end up with is the live rope coming out of the top of the device and the dead rope coming out through the groove of the reverso. And yeah, when you're coming down, it's there's quite a lot of friction there, but for some people that might be quite useful. I can already tell that there might be a few people thinking about a comment which is something like, when am I ever going to repel on a single rope? I'll give you an example of a situation where you might need to do that. When you're doing a crevasse rescue, for example, somebody's fallen into a crevasse and you have to give them first aid before you pull them up that's when you might be rappelling on a single strand of rope. The other way that you can rappel on a single rope with enough friction is to use a super munter like this. So that's a knot that you need to learn how to tie and practice using. The benefit with this is you can get a lot of extra friction and it doesn't twist the rope up as much as well. Another example of rappelling on a single strand of rad line is if you're using something like the BL Escaper, which can be a really cool option if you understand how that device works then you can use a 60 meter rad line and a BL escaper and you can do full 60 meter repels and that's a really light option. So if you're repelling on two strands of rope which is a lot more common then I do actually find that me personally for my weight as long as that rappel isn't totally free hanging and I have re really big heavy skis on that this is actually enough friction with just one carabiner. I feel like I can control the rappel enough. But if you weigh a little bit more than me or 
but you haven't got that much experience with these ropes, I would definitely suggest using an extra carabiner where you clip the carabiner through both the strands and through the uh, loop here. And that's going to give you that extra friction that you need when you're going down on these super thin ropes. The other thing that you need to think about when using these ropes is a Prusik hitch cord or a Prusik loop. Now these ones are made by a company called Rope Light LLC in the States. I'm going to leave a link to these down in the description. This is a Prusik loop and this is a kind of VT hitch cord style thing, depends what your preference is. These can be easier to release under load which is quite useful in some situations. So sometimes I carry one of each of those with me. The important thing with any of these Prusiks is to test it out with your weight and to just kind of get used to how they work. Now, I'll give you an example of a situation where you will need a Prusik to work. If you're rappelling on two ropes and you need to reascend back up that rope, you will need a Prusik to go around both ropes because you can't use a Tiblock and a micro traction simultaneously. You might get some slippage and moving around. So you really need a Prusik that can go around and grip onto those. Things like the Sterling hollow block, for example, just simply don't grip onto these ropes. It's too slippery on the outside, it's too thin. Yeah, so if you've got a sterling hollow block or a normal six mil Prusik cord, then it's probably not gonna grip onto this rope that well. So you really need to think about getting specific Prusiks that work with it. So these rope light ones are a good option. And here's some other ones that I made myself out of four mil Technora sheath Dyneema. So it's Technora on the outside and Dyneema on the inside. So it's relatively strong. It's strong enough for the purpose of, you know, using it as a Prusik hitch cord, which is basically just putting your weight onto the rope. And you will need at least two of those for different things that you're gonna be doing. So I'll leave a link to where I got this from. It's not particularly cheap, but it does the trick. And it's quite difficult to get the ends of this to seal. That's why I've put this kind of PTEX on the end of this cord and I've melted that PTEX on. So it's kind of like created a kind of little um, seal on the end of this rope. If you don't do that, basically it starts to fray and it becomes really messy really quickly. So these work well. I've tested these with my weight, which is my weight plus all my ski gear hanging on a single strand. The Rope Light LLC ones are rated to seven kilonewtons, but they're not certified by the UIAA, which means you are in some ways taking responsibility for what you're doing. But, you know, as is with a lot of mountaineering, you have to take some responsibility for the risks that you're taking. I'd say it's definitely better to have something that definitely functions and grips onto this rope rather than having something that's too thick and can slide back down. So there you go, that's an overview of some of the gear that you need and some of the techniques that you need to know to be able to get the most out of using these ropes. It's definitely worth practicing with all these things in a safe environment. So you know, practice hanging off a beam in your house or find a low branch on a tree and practice kind of going up and down the rope, practice using it for crevasse rescue, go and practice using slope cutting techniques in a safe environment before you actually have to do it for real and just get out there and learn how to use these ropes. The more comfortable you get with them, the more you feel that you've unlocked the potential that they have. And that's a really useful thing because it can keep the weight down in your bag, which is just gonna give you a better time in the mountains. But don't forget there are limitations to what you can do with these ropes. If there's ever a chance that somebody could fall off and take a leader fall, for example, if you're climbing a pitch of ice and placing screws as you go up, this isn't the rope that you want to be using. You want to be using a dynamic rope for that. So that's the clear limitations of these ropes is they are completely static. So they're not like a climbing rope. You could definitely hurt yourself or break something if you take a big fall on these ropes. So we're going to leave it there for now. Let me know if you've got any questions down in the comments. Let me know if you've got any other ideas or things that you might use a Petzl rad line for. And as I said, I'm planning on doing more videos in the future of some of the techniques that you might use a rad line for, for example, crevasse rescue and rappelling and slope cutting. So stay tuned for that. And as always, thank you very much for watching. Don't forget to subscribe, give us a thumbs up, let us know what you thought about that video in the comments, and I'll see you next time.